Hello everyone and welcome to Shepherd of the Valley's service for Good Friday evening. This is the night when we remember the crucifixion of our Lord. You may notice that there are no pyramids, I don't have my stool. There's nothing here but us and the cross. And we've done this service several different ways. Sometimes we've had drama, sometimes we've done other things. But tonight we just want to bring it to you quietly and simply. Almost, you might consider this like a little more of a podcast or something to listen to in a dark room or as you go to bed or whatever it is, so that the words of the story of the gospel can wash over you. And that narrative of Jesus giving his life for all of us can take root in our lives, in our consciousness, in our hearts. So we're going to have the story, a little sermon, some prayers, and that's about it. But that central focus on the heart of our faith journey will help us understand not just our relationship with God on this night and all that God has done for us, but also the glory of Easter morning, which we are about to experience a couple days from now. So let us prepare our hearts to hear the gospel story of how Jesus died for us. The Good Friday Gospel is from John chapter 18, verses 1 through 19 and verse 42. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single word of those who you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back to its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. 
Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So, are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put, a, put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him in the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to let you know that I can find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robes. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him to yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate re tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast a lot. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, 
Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He saw this has testified so that you may also believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of these bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. What are we to do when we are confronted with a story like this? A story that doesn't just highlight the tragedy and brokenness of the world that, frankly, we all know far too well but a story that also highlights our absolute inability to do anything meaningful about the same. I can only imagine the unfolding horror and panic and just tragic sadness that overcame the disciples and Jesus' friends and his family and his mom as they watched this unfold to be betrayed by one of his closest friends on the very night when he had fed them and given himself to them, to watch as religious leaders who were meant to uphold goodness and justice unfairly condemned him and then drug him to the court of their greatest enemy, the oppressor who had taken over their country and their culture, whom they cursed with every breath, but they would rather consort with this tyrannical overlord than put up with Jesus for one more day and how they made false accusations against him, and how they whipped up the crowds against him, and how that authority, who was also tasked with upholding justice, decided that it was more convenient to get rid of this one man, however innocent and noble he may have been, than to face a riot from a crowd suddenly turned against him. How they must have suffered with that walk to the cross, what must have been going through Jesus' mind, not just personal pain, but also that sadness that comes with maybe fearing that your mission, that your purpose has come to this 
Anyone who's ever faced a failed relationship or a failed fight for justice or wanted to raise their kids perfectly and ended up somehow with it a tragic mess can understand this feeling. When you've done everything you know how to do, when you've taught everything you could teach, when you've fought in every way you can and still it is not turning out right. And then finally we see the hill and the cross and the nails and the slowly dwindling breath before Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the promised one, the one who had done the miracles and all the feeding and all the healing and all the giving of hope and teaching us about God and telling us that God was with all of us and God loves us infinitely. Watching this man, this gift, this shining hope, breathe his last. And only one word, one question comes to mind. The only thing that will suffice in the face of this story. Why? Why? And you know what? We spent 2,000 years and more trying to answer that question. And I'm not sure that we can wrap it up in a tidy bow. I'm not sure it's supposed to be. If this is something that you can intellectually understand and go, I get it now, you've missed the impact of the story. This isn't a little tub of grace that you float around in and bathe in as you choose. This is a tidal wave of history and destiny and divine providence and as we said, tragedy, overwhelming everything that we thought we knew and everything that we think we are. And as we're floating in it, trying to figure out the why, that is somehow appropriate that we look around with that same bewilderment that the people around Jesus felt and have some of that same experience that this horrible, horrible tragedy gave to him. But you know what? We are not left alone in the midst of this wondering and drifting and questioning. Because there are at least a couple answers to that that make sense. Before we get to them though, I want to point out one that is too often said that does not make sense. And this is very important to understand. We say sometimes, Jesus died for our sins. And that is semi-accurate, but we've translated that in a certain way too often in churches and in casual conversation. We've painted a God somewhere up there in heaven, some stern father who demanded that the price be paid for sin. And when human beings couldn't pay it, he sent his own son to pay him back as if God were angry and vengeful and apart from humanity and was ruthless and arrogant enough to say, I will be paid off and I don't care who does it. And people who talk like this paint Jesus as the noble sacrifice, not for us or even to us, which is what he ended up being on that cross, but somehow a sacrifice to God, who like an abusive father would not be satisfied or let his anger go until he got payment or got what he wanted. That is absolutely wrong. And I lament every second, every word that's been spent on that explanation. And I know out there, many of you have heard it and you have heard it wielded to make you feel guilt or shame, to manipulate you into doing what the speaker wanted you to do as if he were somehow lifted above that and you were subject to it. And I would say to you, I am sorry. 
on behalf of the communities who are supposed to tell this story well. I apologize to every one of you who has heard it told that way. That was not right, that's not who God is, and that absolutely drains the significance and the power out of this moment. To truly understand what's going on, we need to rewind back a little bit and listen to the whole story. For it is the story of a God who made the world and everything in it and made it completely good and who made people in that world and who loved them dearly. But those people tried to take over the world and to use its power for themselves against not just God, but against each other to blame and to create hierarchies and to take authority over each other, usurping the place of God, first biting a fruit and then creating kingdoms and patriarchies and all this stuff. And so it ended up, first of all, that nobody was perfect or able to live perfectly the way they should. Nobody's life was free from pain. And what benefited one person, cost another. And the more power the people got, the more cost there was to the people around them. Not only have we seen this hold true in human circles, but also notice how disturbingly similar that is to the story, the false story, that we just told about a hierarchical, patriarchal God demanding satisfaction at the cost of another, and the fact that that other was his only son makes that story worse, not better. But as you can see, that's not really God's story. That's the story of how we recreated the world. And when God saw this, and knew this was what would happen. He said something simple. There will come an end to your power. You will be able to do what you want for you have tried to take over the world and have at it. But this limit I put on it, your ability to hurt others will not last forever. Neither will your brokenness and pain that you suffer at the hands of others or at the hands of the world or even at your own hands as you do these things and it breaks your soul as much as it breaks your neighbors. There will be an end. And that end will simply be this. There will come a time when your power will fade, each one of you. There will come a time when you age and there will come a time when you pass. And it's very sad that this has to happen, but the alternative is warfare forever, patriarchy and hierarchy costing people forever, oppression and abuse forever, and other things like cancer forever, tidal waves forever, all these other things that are hallmarks of a broken world, never ever ending, and God says, I will not have that because I love you too much. So, there will come an end. And that end is death. And when, you're pa when you pass, so too will the pain that you endure, so too will the pain that you inflict. But there was a problem with this. For God so loved us that he was not willing to let go of us, not just in our imperfect lives today, but even after death. The problem with death is it separates us from each other and the world and even with God if left alone. And God looked at Adam and Eve and all the people who had come from them down to you and me, said, you know what? Even though you can't live forever because of this imperfection, because it would hurt you and ruin the world, I'm not letting go of you. I need to figure out a way to make us together again, to make us whole again, to make life the way it should have been again. 
And so, you get to live out the life that you have chosen with all its brokenness, pain, and whatever, and it will end, but that ending cannot be the end of the story. There must be something more. But in order for there to be something more, that something cannot just be an extension or a redoing of what we already have. That would create the same problem again and solve nothing. Instead, there needs to be something new. There needs to be a renewal. There needs to be a life that is only joy without the pain, that is only fullness without the brokenness, that is only togetherness infinitely without the separation. And I can't do that with you, nor can you do that yourself. So here's what I will do. I will come in the form of Jesus Christ, and I will live among you, and I will be human. And by the way, while I'm human, I'll do a lot of nifty things to show you the way it should be, to show you that you can trust in my love, to show you what life should be like. Where there are sick people, I will heal them. Where people are broken or ostracized, I will bring them back in. Where people are lonely or depressed or somehow broken in body or spirit, I will love them and I will call them my own. Where people are mistaken, I will encourage them. Where people are wielding authority in a way that hurts people, I will correct them. And most of all, I will walk with you all of you through this life. But I know that that's not really going to be enough. That is not my central purpose for coming. Because no matter how much I teach you, no matter how much I heal you and restore you into this life, you're just restored into brokenness with brains that can't comprehend or reach the perfection that you really need. So, at the end, I will do one more thing. When I couldn't change your world, and when I couldn't change you, if I left it unaltered, instead, I will change everything. I will change the nature of life and death themselves. And here is how God did that. When Jesus walked the journey to the cross, he took upon him all the pain, all the brokenness, everything that ever was wrong or was wrong in his time or would be wrong forevermore, every tear that we have cried, every illness that our bodies have experienced, every loss that we felt in our hearts, every bit of abuse or neglect or starvation or lack of housing, or whatever it is that afflicts us. Every bit of brokenness from all those things, which is what we call, in essence, sin, Jesus took on himself. And Jesus embraced it all, as Jesus embraced us all, with his arms wide open, in what we hoped could be a hug. But as it turns out, you can't hug brokenness and fix it and make it all better. It only continues to grow from that approval. So instead, he opened his arms wide on the cross and embraced every bit of our pain, every bit of the struggle, every bit of the wrongness and sin. And he said, give it all to me. I will hold it just as I hold you. I will hug it just as I hug you. I will take it and claim it just as I claim you as my own. I didn't do any of it. I didn't cause any of it. But that's exactly why I am able to say this with authority and hold it. 
because it's not my sin that I am embracing. It's yours. And I will take it all on my shoulders. And he did. And you know what? He took it into death. And it's very interesting because a lot of people think that when you're crucified, you die from the bleeding. That is actually not true. You die when you are weighed down and your body collapses upon your lungs as you hang there and you suffocate. And Jesus had not just the weight of his own body on that cross, but the weight of everything that I have just described, the weight that humanity had given him because it had no other hope for salvation. And Jesus took those things into himself, embraced them, and died with them, not to pay off God, but to absorb them and renew us by taking them the only place where they could end, the only place that brokenness could end, into death. Now, spoiler alert, that wasn't the end of the story. We're going to talk about the resurrection in a couple of days, but I can tell you this. When Jesus rose from the dead, when that tomb was empty on that morning, the biggest part of the joy was not just that one being was back. It's that when he rose, the love and the life and the togetherness came back. But all that brokenness that he took on himself for us did not. It died, and it would never, ever return. So that in walking through these gates of death, in dying for us, in dying with our sins, Jesus opened up the way to new life when we could not. As you think of this night, don't just think how guilty you are for giving Jesus sins. I mean, that's part of the story, but all of us do that. No human being could avoid it. Think instead how amazing it is that God saw you and me and said, you know what? They're broken and they're hurt and they're lost and they're mistaken, but I love them and I still won't let them go. And I'm just going to take this stuff that is obscuring that beauty and that is keeping them from life and I'm going to accept it and I'm going to do something about it so that they can be the people they were meant to be instead of the people who perish daily until they reach an inevitable broken end. That is the gift of this story. Not that Jesus did it for God, but Jesus did it for you and me. And not because we were terrible, but because Jesus regarded us as beautiful and beloved and would not let anything change that definition, even if it meant going to death on a cross itself. That is a powerful testament to the love and perseverance of God in the midst of all the world's brokenness. It's also a powerful testament to how much you mean to the one who loves us all. May this story make you reflect. May this story make you look at brokenness and sin and pain a different way as something you really don't want to celebrate or be a part of. But most of all, may this story inspire you with a deep passion that God has for you and your life. And may your life and the world around you be transformed by it so that when you look at yourself and the world, you do not just see the emptiness and pain, 
but you see love overflowing now and forever for all of us. Amen. Here are the Good Friday prayers of intercession. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all the nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for leaders and ministers everywhere. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church, and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the words in your arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we walk this journey together through the weekend, we pray that your mind and your heart might be full of the love that God has for you, and that we may not be able to focus so much on the tragedy of the story that we have just heard, but also on the purpose that will be revealed and renewed on Easter morning. We pray that the Spirit of God go with you through your days and through your nights, and that you may know how much God cares for you and how much God gives to call you His own.